Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver But that does skip over an incredibly long list of things the Democrats are already uh, willing to look at. And it seems to me that, frankly, the White House is already treading water as it is. That's right. And look, if the Democrats were to take over the House of Representatives, which a lot of people in Trump's orbit think is the most likely scenario in November's elections, uh, they're going to take over the congressional committees, the oversight committees. They're going to have the power to subpoena information and testimony from the White House. You're going to have hearings, investigations uh, into the president's uh, decisions, into sort of widespread corruption within the administration elsewhere, also perhaps into the president's businesses. And there's fear in Trump's orbit that the White House doesn't have the legal staff to deal with all of that or the communication staff, frankly. But there is also fear about impeachment and the president talking to Rudy Giuliani a little bit about impeachment. Giuliani told us that he thinks that's the one uh, sort of thing out there still hanging for the president that they're concerned about. Mm. And Shauna, you've covered uh, Congress before. I mean, I think to a certain extent we may have forgotten what a um a committee with teeth looks like because we have not seen an opposition party go after a president in at least a little a while. Years. In a couple of years. Uh, but you remember back to, say, the Benghazi probe with Trey Gowdy. That was an incredible amount of power. It, went, it was incredibly expensive. It went on for years. It was backed by the um, Speaker of the House. They put Trey Gowdy right. on that for a reason. And he, he went to town. I think there is, there is a playbook, um, if the White House would like to look at it, is that you know the Democrats in House Oversight, the Democrats and some of the other committees have have sent a lot of letters, have asked for a lot of things, a lot of things that they can't get because they do not have the power right now to do it. Right. But they have their list ready to go. And perhaps your story says this, and I, I need to read it, and I will. Um, <laughs> just going to admit that. Um, but it is... It is not unclear all of the things the Democrats want to go after. Yeah, well, and Tim, fact, there was a uh, spreadsheet that was circulated. That's just what I was, was going to say. And it was House Republicans that built that spreadsheet, Tim. So they clearly are getting ready for this. They know what's coming. And it's interesting because you will talk to some Republicans around town who have the president's ear who actually believe that in, in some... Uh, sort of three-dimensional chess Machiavellian scenario that losing the House of Representatives is the best possible thing that could happen to ensure Donald Trump's re-election in 2020. They believe that a young, Up inexperienced House Democratic <laughs> majority with possibly new leadership in a number of positions, all the way up to Speaker perhaps, would overreach and would provide the ideal foil for Donald Trump and sort of rally the base around him. And while that may be true in some, again, sort of three-dimensional uh, uh, hypothetical situation, this is the concrete reality of what President Trump would be facing with a House Democratic majority. They will be looking Looking into everything and anything that they can, and they're going to make life very, very difficult for the administration. Ken, to his point, almost seems as though Republicans have spent this entire, uh, not even just this election cycle, they've spent years attacking Nancy Pelosi, but if I'm listening and hearing you correctly, they're actually probably more afraid of having her in charge of the Democratic majority if, it, if that were to happen. Uh, potentially, and there always is the risk of overplaying one's hand. But in this case, you have some real substantive, meaty issues that congressional staffs are really well prepared and uniquely situated to dive into. And Democrats are already doing this type of opposition research or just vetting of some of these decisions. And it doesn't and even need to be powerless. researches in some cases, right? I mean, they can try to every avenue that they've ever had to try and get Trump's tax returns, for example. And that's a, a great example. Uh, we have uh, security clearances. We have Hurricane Maria response. I mean, there are so many things that fit more into the traditional playbook of what you would see an opposition party going after a president for. We kind of forget about those types of things because we're so focused on the scandal of the moment in the Trump presidency, which are... I was going to say, you haven't even mentioned Scott Pruitt. Right. Which <laughs> in our many cases, like, 
quite sensational. I mean, Scott Pruitt is a great example. A, like a, a, a type of scandal, a scandal like that would really hamstring and maybe even uh, cripple a traditional presidential administration. What you have with Trump is there's just so many scandals all at once. You kind of forget about these more traditional Washington scandals. It is Tuesday, the 4th of September of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Just a little smidgen of Hungarian hot paprika, folks. Just a smidgen. It goes a long way. Oh, yeah. Ask uh, Sebastian Gorka. He knows. Hey, don't you pine for the days for the traditional Washington scandals, like endless Benghazi hearings, you know, uh, investigations into nowhere, but basically uh, waits out the clock. Uh, you know, the scandals that you can just like pass off, like denying the black president, who had won two times, by the way, with vast popular majorities, and guess what? Overwhelming majorities in the Electoral College, too. But this guy, who lost by 3 million popular in the popular vote, questionable Electoral College victory. No one is prepared for when the Democrats bring in their investigators and their, well, <laughs> the cops. The Democrats are, are going to be the cops. Maybe that's why they're so afraid. Well, uh, we do know the only strategy the Trump White House has is the scorched earth policy. That is their go-to strategy. Blow the whole mother up. It's a weird, skewed kind of mobster mentality, but that's what we have here. And uh, I'm not going to sit around and uh, try to point fingers and find blame because we already know that the rise of corporate power probably had a lot to do with bringing on fascism in America. Because isn't that what fascism is? The wedding of big business and government. I mean, business is right in there with prisons now. Oh, yeah, it's a growth industry. As long as you got people to lock up, you got to keep finding people to lock up. They're down to locking up babies now. Baby gulags. Tender age prisons. Okay. Um, I prefer to be on the right side of history, even if I get a bullet in the head. I don't know. It's just something about uh, a concept of freedom and right and wrong. All right. No amount of money is worth. I, I see. This is what I don't understand. The cravenness of it. This is the argument we hear. He's helping me biz, in business. He, I, my, I, I have some friends and they've always been pretty well off and they're doing even better now. And they have to admit that, uh, you know, pushing money their way is making them pretty happy. And apparently it's enough for them to turn a blind eye to baby gulags where babies and toddlers are dying of respiratory diseases. Because what does private business do when they run things? They want to cut corners. They want to deny services so they can make more money. So that's why you don't change a baby's diapers for about six months. You know, wait till they can change them themselves. Or maybe it was a scientific study done by Mengele. How long will this baby suffer in his own fecal matter before it learns to change its own diaper? <sighs> I think we have those types in our system. I mean, we only come from that stock, don't we? All right, well... Let's uh, make sure that we win by so much vast majorities in the midterms that they, they, meaning whoever the big amorphous they are, and as a conglomerate of they, even with hostile foreign powers that write things in Cyrillic, they can only work the margins, all right? They can only work the margins. 
And that's what's so frightening for them. That's why only 18% of America is represented by the Senate. Yeah, you got that one right. Ouch! Talk about the tyranny of the minority. My God. What's on the rest of the menu today? In Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, West Coast Cookbook Speakeasy Bistro Cafe. Well, a Florida luxury hotel refused to let black entertainment television co-founder and billionaire Bob Johnson, who just happens to be black, they wouldn't let him go into his hotel room because he was wearing sunglasses while being black. Uh huh. And they told him, well, that's just a standard in the industry. And he said, well, I own 164 hotels. I think I know what a standard is. And they just sniffed their haughty way and went on their way. Oh, yeah. Well, speaking of which, American racism is seeping into Europe despite a ban on U.S. white nationalist leaders there. The, the Nazi far-right white, evang- uh, white uh, nationalist, well, white evangelists, too. They are evangelical about their whiteness now, aren't they? Sing it from high on the mountain. Uh, this is just sweeping the globe like mud shark back in the day, if you know what I mean. And the New Yorker wanted to give Bannon a platform in which to, well, let's be real, normalize this behavior. No, thank you, Remnick. That's a whole other story. Excuse me. And African-American preachers are fed up with far-right prosperity gospel white evangelicals, and they have every reason to be. I mean, look what's happening in Europe. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Egypt unearths one of the oldest Nile Delta villages. And scientists suspect an unconventional microwave weapon in the mystery attacks on U.S. diplomats in Cuba and China. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com you will notice the chat room link at the rightish of the page monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Go to her uh, uh, websites and uh, social media and you'll find links in which you can throw a few dollars her way so she can affect uh, the finalization of her hardware and software updates and improvements yes indeed to the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com are the chat are the <laughs> contribute donate buttons definitely located there by superior graphic design to entice you to well help resistance radio resist this terrible scourge that is uh, a scourging the face of america right now and uh yes so your help that way keeps resistance radio broadcasting 24 7 365 except for when there's acts of god you know like when the isp says well we have to have an outage now or the electric company says oh we have to have an outage now you know those kinds of acts of god other than that uh we are here to help resist in our way and your help has been your generous help has been instrumental in that and we thank you for that generosity you can follow netroots radio on twitter at netroots radio we are on facebook as well and you can follow me on twitter at justice putnam i do post show notes and links diaries on daily Co's where i can be found as justice putnam yeah it's me let's see oh you can follow the show on on Facebook and a little bit of a difference in how you can get to us on Twitter. We are there at 
Cookbook West. You could just type in West Coast Cookbook, as I've mentioned before in previous shows, and it will just show up at Cookbook West. Go there and you'll see. You can pick up podcasts of the show by way of TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, YouTube, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right. We got that out of the way. This uh, first article here is out of Raw Story by Noor al Sabai. And uh, apparently, uh, the guy who started uh, the Black Entertainment Television uh, Corporation or media company, Bob Johnson, is America's first black billionaire. I I wasn't so sure of that. I, I, I tried looking, and it could be true. I actually think that that's just in today's dollars in Dollars back in the day? Maybe. I don't know. I'm just thinking of, uh, say, like towns in Indiana that got raised by white supremacists because blacks were getting a little bit too uppity and they had their own banks and they had their own way of life, which was sort of like very American Main Street and all. Can't have that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, but, uh, no, I got to say, Bob Johnson isn't necessarily a unknown commodity. I know they all look the same to certain elements in the South. They being black people. Because, yes, Bob Johnson, the co-founder of black entertainment television, happens to be black. He goes to his luxury hotel that he's booked, and he's been there before. And uh, he thought that the woman at the front desk was actually joking when she said, I'll let you go to your room when you take your sunglasses off, boy. I, she, I, she, she didn't say boy, but that's what she meant. You could tell by her eyes. Now, I got to tell you, I've checked in a lot of people at pretty swank hotels. Boutique bed and breakfast in the city of San Francisco. I've been in a few, you know, all around the world. One of the perks of being, you know, married at the time to a French actress. But, you know, like I said, that's another story. Um, So I, I, I don't know very many people in the entertainment industry that don't wear sunglasses. I know that's a double negative. Okay. Not very many. Do not wear sunglasses. Most of them do. I don't know. It's like, you know, you're protecting your eyes. Or most of the... I also learned when I was attempting my foray into, you know, performing. Usually you wore sunglasses because the sun was so bright at 12 or noon or 1 o'clock when you got up, you couldn't stand it. So if you're checking in at 3... Yeah, yeah, you're probably going to be wearing some sunglasses. It's just the way it is. But regardless, they wouldn't let Bob Johnson into his room, and he thought the front lady at the front desk was joking. And uh, she just said, well, I can't check you in until you take off your sunglasses. So then Johnson called the police. When no compromise was reached after the police were called, he just left the hotel. Now, the O. Palm Beach spokesperson said it's standard operating procedure in the hospitality industry to ask guests to remove sunglasses for their safety. But Johnson, who owns 165 hotels, says that's not true. He said, I think it's a silly rule that they have. And I think it has overtones of racial profiling. Well, that's a nice way of putting it. Travis Geddes of Raw Story brings us this next offering here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy's Bistro Cafe. Terrytown Charter Tuesdays. 
just is. So, so, so you don't forget. American white nationalists such as David Duke and Richard Spencer are banned from many European countries, but their racist ideas are finding a growing audience overseas. Laws in some European countries prohibit the organization and assembly of overtly racist groups like the KKK, but they often hide their intentions and affiliations to build followings, you know, like a Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. You know, sort of like one of those. A German parliamentary investigation found four active KKK groups and David Duke was found guilty in Italy of trying to start an overtly racist and anti-Semitic group called the European American Unity and Rights Organization. Spencer is banned from 26 EU countries, but he and other online white nationalists exploit the migration of Middle Eastern refugees to build what Steve Bannon, the former White House chief strategist, calls the movement. Yeah, you look at that guy and you know what kind of movement he needs. Let them call you racist, Bannon told the French National Front, or as we like to call it over in France, the Front National. Let them call you xenophobes. Wear it as a badge of honor. Okay. And they do. European populists warn that immigrants will destroy their national cultures. And Italy and Hungary have each elected right-wing demagogues to top government positions. Right-wing parties have also made gains in Germany, Sweden, Austria, and elsewhere. Now, back in the U.S., the Klan remains a fringe group, but its hateful ideology is spreading through newer groups and has found an apparent ally in Donald Trump. Apparent? Who David Duke has enthusiastically endorsed and continues to endorse it to this very minute. In fact, rest assured, David Duke is invoking Trump's name wherever he goes and can actually speak to people in Europe. That's very clear. Cafe Pardo West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is an article out of Alternet by Alex Henderson. In the Donald Trump era, far right white evangelicals, and I also include in this description prosperity gospel white evangelicals, because the black preachers uh, pretty much, well, the ones who are consider themselves to be evangelicals themselves. Uh, the prosperity gospel, yes, there's some prosperity gospel preachers within the black community, but they are not part of this contingent of black preachers who are the stalwarts of the evangelical movement that has been part and parcel of black identity for I don't know how long. Okay, just to be clear. Well, they have been jumping for joy in this Donald Trump era. As they see it, they now have a president who is on their side, Trump. Despite allegations, come on, Alex, allegations. We already know that these allegations of sexual impropriety, they're codified in his, well, many divorces and breakups and payoffs. Come on. These aren't just made up. They're not just allegations. 
Many of these payments have already been adjudicated in court. They were minor in the eyes of the law. Well, despite allegations, he had extramarital affairs with an adult film star and a former Playboy model and paid both of them hush money to keep quiet. He continues to be on very friendly terms with James Dobson, Tony Perkins, Franklin, Franklin Graham, and other theocrats who insist that he is fighting for Christianity. Now, let me see. James Dobson. Doesn't he have an overly made-up sidekick? And they're interchangeable. Just put on a bunch of makeup. It'll be fine. Just like James Baker. Uh, Tony Perkins. Did you know that he was also a Grand Marshal of the KKK? Yeah, a lot of people forget that. When he was a cop in Louisiana, by the way. And Franklin Graham. You know, the offspring of demagogues usually always try to be more of a demagogue than the than who sired them. Everybody knows that. Well, listening to black talk radio stations in the U.S., one encounters a much more negative view of Trump's presidency, and many African-American pre- preachers are absolutely fed up. Trump is not popular in the African-American community, and that includes black ministers, the Reverend Al Sharpton, who hosts Politics Nation on MSNBC, as well as a syndicated radio program, Keeping It Real, is perhaps Trump's most visible critic in the black church. Yet, there are many other African-American preachers who have nothing good to say about Trump, and for them, liberal, progressive politics and Christianity go hand in hand. You know, the part where it says the meek shall inherit the earth? Not the person who has the most money that they've wrested from all entities of existence that they can get. I mean, there is still the eye of the needle parable. Come on. When the Reverend Raphael G. Warnock spoke at Atlanta's Atlanta's historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in January to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, he originally had planned to avoid Trump bashing during a sermon. But when Trump described El Salvador, Haiti, and some uh, and some African nations as shithole countries, Warnock felt he had no choice but to speak out. And he denounced Trump as, quote, a willfully ignorant, racist, xenophobic, narcissist con man. Now, Steve Bannon would say, wear that label as a badge of honor. From Detroit to Philadelphia... To Memphis, the African Methodist Episcopal Church attracts plenty of liberals and progressives. And when the Reverend J. Edgar Boyd, pastor of the first AME church in Los Angeles, asked his congregation to pray for Trump, he was booed. Yet the boos quickly turned to applause when Boyd asserted that Trump must be held accountable for his words, his deeds, and his actions. Unlike all the far-right buffoons who consider Trump's presidency a gift from God, Boyd wasn't asking the congregation to pray for Trump because he liked the president's politics. It was more of a pray-for-the-sinner type of thing, because that guy is going to hell. Pray for his eternal soul. Indeed, Boyd is no right-winger. He had been a scathing critic of police overreach in the black community. In June, the Council of Bishops and the African Methodist Episcopal Church signed a joint statement condemning Trump's draconian immigration policy and the separation of families that has come with it. The AME ministers asserted, quote, The Bible does not justify discrimination masked as racism, sexism, economic inequality, oppression, or the abuse of children. Jesus, who was an immigrant who had to leave the place of his birth to immigrate to Egypt because of an oppressive leader and system, admonishes all that the poor, children, the elderly, widows and widowers should have a special place of justice and compassion in every nation. Trump is so unpopular in the black community that when John Gray, who heads the Relentless Church in Greenville, South Carolina, visited the White House on August 1st to meet with the president, he was criticized for it repeatedly on black radio. Gray has said that one 
Of the reasons he went to the White House was that he hoped to discuss prison reform with Trump, but his wife urged him not to, asserting that many black churchgoers would see it as an endorsement of Trump and be upset about it. And sure enough, upset is what they were. When Trump is criticized on black radio for his alliance with the far-right evangelicals, the subject of the prosperity gospel or prosperity theology often comes up. And Trump is routinely lambasted for favoring the rich over the poor. Often, black churchgoers will quote scripture when they call Sharpton's Keeping It Real and other programs, noting all the Bible verses that urge Christians to look after the poor. And one verse that gets quoted a lot is, it is easier to fit through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, many black ministers view the Christian right as a perversion of Christianity. The Christian right's fondness for Trump exposes Dobson, Perkins, and others as the charlatans that they are indeed. All right, well, let's get to our break. And when we come back, we will go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. Day. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Hi, I'm Scientific American Podcast Editor Steve Mursky, and here's a short piece from the August 2018 issue of the magazine in the section called Advances, Dispatches from the Frontiers of Science, Technology, and Medicine. The article is called Quick Hits, and it's a rundown of some science and technology stories from around the globe, compiled by editorial intern Maya Miller. From Mexico. Cavers and scientists in the Mexican state of Oaxaca discovered that the world's ninth largest known cave is deeper than previously thought. With a depth of 5,118 feet, it houses dozens of species not found anywhere else. From Brazil, archaeologists discovered a tooth from an opossum-sized creature that once inhabited what is now Brazil— The oldest known mammal found in the region to date, it lived somewhere between 87 million and 70 million years ago, when Tyrannosaurus rex still roamed. From Scotland, Microsoft has begun installing computer servers on the seafloor near Scotland's northern islands as an alternative to data farms on land. The idea is that the water will create a cool environment for the servers. From Zimbabwe, The oldest African baobab tree, roughly 2,500 years of age, died within the past decade, researchers found. Nine of the 13 oldest baobabs, all in Africa, have perished since 2005, possibly as a result of unprecedented climate change. From China, the Chinese government announced it will take on a new role in monitoring scientific misconduct. Such cases, previously handled by institutions, will be maintained in a national database and could disqualify scientists from applying for certain research opportunities and jobs. And from India, solar power is on the rise in India. In the first quarter of 2018, newly installed panels produced 3,269 megawatts. Solar power now accounts for 6.3% of India's total power output. That was Quick Hits by Maya Miller. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The American founders learned lessons from ancient history when creating their state constitutions and the U.S. Constitution. They learned from Greek and Roman history that although democracies may appear to begin well, they tend to end in tyranny when the poor attack the rich. Class warfare breeds chronic disorder. The people then submit to tyrants who enter the scene promising security. Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist 9 that history is not a good guide for creating government because it provides so many bad examples. 
It is impossible to read the history of the petty republics of Greece and Italy without feeling sensations of horror and disgust at the distractions with which they were continually agitated, and at the rapid succession of revolutions by which they were kept in a state of perpetual vibration between the extremes of tyranny and anarchy. If they exhibit occasional calms, these only serve as short-lived contrasts to the furious storms that are to succeed. Whether history or reason provides a better guide to designing government animated the debates over how best to govern the states and the new nation. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. You can help stop the Trump agenda in its tracks. Make sure you're registered to vote. Go to rockthevote.org. And on November 6th, vote for Democrats up and down the ticket. This message, a public service from all the fine people of netrootsradio.com. Can the Trump administration make millions of people invisible? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. In a 2016 case, the United States Supreme Court reaffirmed that the Constitution requires representation in the House of Representatives, and thus the Electoral College, to be determined by a state's and the country's total population, which includes voters and non-voters, children and adults, long-term and short-term residents, citizens and non-citizens alike. An accurate enumeration, the Constitution's 18th century word for a census, is the prerequisite. But the Trump administration is disingenuously trying to circumvent this constitutional requirement by inserting into the 2020 census a question about citizenship, which serves no legitimate purpose, has not been included in the census for some 60 years, and targets immigrants. After all, who would answer a question or fill out a form that could cause law enforcement, thing Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, to target you, a parent or your child or even a distant relative or a friend living in your home for possible incarceration or deportation? The answer is no one would do that, which is why 17 state attorneys general have sued in federal court to stop the citizenship question from being included in the census, to stop the Trump administration from making immigrants invisible, and rather to ensure that in America everyone is counted because everyone counts. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. I'm Mark Belanger. In Brazil, a court has ruled that former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, known simply as Lula, cannot be on the ballot for a national election schedule for October. Labor leaders in the country have vowed to continue their campaign to have Lula, who is currently in prison, eligible for election as president. They say that the corruption charges against Lula are deliberately contrived by the right wing in the country to stop him from becoming president again. Lula was president of Brazil from 2003 to 2011 and acknowledged to have helped millions get out of abject poverty. I talked to Sharon Burrow about Lula and his bid for the presidency from his jail cell. Ms. Burrow is the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. The ITUC represents national labor centers such as the Ghana Trades Union Congress at the world level. Ms. Burrow visited Lula in August. I asked her first what labor leaders in Brazil are saying about the corruption charges which have resulted in the 72-year-old Lula being jailed for 12 years. We are all in agreement. National unions, international unions, the ITUC has consistently said that Lula is a political prisoner. He's guilty of no charges. We've had international jurists go through all of the so-called evidence it is fabricated. There is no evidence that stack up against the charges. This is a political ploy to see Lula jailed so he cannot stand as president. It's that simple. Tell us about your visit with Lula. How long were you able to talk to him? What did he say? Lula is an amazing man. He's truly a leader, a giant amongst others. He's in isolation totally in isolation. He has no TV, no phone, no internet. He's allowed four or five visitors twice a week for two hours. His family gave up 
an hour of their visiting time so I could visit him with Wagner Freitas, who's the leader of the court in Brazil. I found him strong in spirit, strong mentally and strong physically. He knows that there are hundreds of people who have kept vigil for him outside in the the resistance camp, outside the prison. He says he hears them say good morning and good afternoon. They feed his spirits. But the extraordinary thing about Lula is he is aware. He continues to read whatever newspapers and documents that people can bring him. He knows about the state of the world, but most of all, he's determined for his own people. He says clearly, his people do not need to live in poverty. They do not need to live without social protection. They can have good jobs and just wages. They can live with dignity and Brazil can be rebuilt. We know and agree with him that the government in place is illegitimate. It was born of a political coup. And tragically, this is all about stopping Lula, who is so far ahead in the polls that no one could beat him, no other candidate, from being the president of Brazil. It's political, it's vested interests, corrupt government officials, corporate greed, and indeed elite families. It's a political tragedy and it must stop. The UN has even said the Human Rights Committee made an urgent decision and issued a statement saying that Lula should be allowed to stand for president from his cell. Lula is a political prisoner. He must be freed, and we stand with him. And that's it. International labor news you can use. You can find an extended version of the interview with Ms. Burrow on our website at www.radiolabor.net. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. This broadcast is on holiday until September 10th, but instead of running repeats, we've asked some go-to foreign policy experts what they'll be paying attention to in the weeks to come. Bruce Bennett is a senior defense analyst at the RAND Corporation and is trying to piece together clues about North Korea's true willingness to play along with the U.S. and actually pursue talks leading to denuclearization. For global media outlets and think tanks alike, determining North Korea's nuclear activities more and more often involves acquiring satellite imagery of key North Korean facilities. Those images often form the basis of front-page investigative reports, but satellite imagery hardly tells the full story. It's still not direct evidence. I mean, yeah, we can see a building down there. Yeah, we think uranium enrichment is going on in it. But how many centrifuges are really there, and are they always working, or are they only working 50% of the time? We really don't know a lot, and it creates tremendous uncertainties. But with nuclear inspectors banned from North Korea and the regime carefully withholding clues about its negotiating strategy, Bennett says North Korean defectors are critically valuable now more than ever to the United States. I've talked to a number of very senior North Korean defectors, who can tell you a lot about who is it who's actually advising Kim Jong-un? What's their negotiating philosophy? And that one is terribly interesting because to the North Koreans, an agreement is the midpoint of negotiations, not the end. It's the point where you get to where you establish a baseline and then the smart player does everything he can to adjust that baseline in his favor. And That explains a lot about them. I'm Luke Vargas at the United Nations. For more global news headlines, visit TalkMediaNews.com.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, folks. Yes, indeed. A little, uh, like I say, hot Hungarian paprika goes a long way. And it's very good. All right. Well, we begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 50 degrees. Uh, Forecast uh, overnight low for being in the low 50s, and they were correct. Uh, Let's see. It looks like we're going to have nearly the same temperature as yesterday, which was uh, low 90s. So that looks like that may be the case. Sunny weather throughout the day. So uh, the end of summer is beginning to wane. And we might as well have that nice end of summer weather that we, we prefer. Right now, the air quality is quite good. And we'll get into that. It seems at least the prevailing winds are not is not blowing smoke our way. And hopefully most of the... Uh, Fires and wildfires and that have been burning probably are now extinguishing themselves because they're running out of fuel, which means that, yeah, they'll just have to wait for a couple of years to get trees to come back. But that's the cycle of life now, isn't it? Well, uh, oh, I should say that because of the, well, to me, it's still warmer days and nights and early mornings. We do have the windows open, so engine noises you may have been hearing throughout the show is because the windows are open and i like to do that why turn on the air conditioner and have all that we don't want that all right let's see we're going to be sunny and oh winds right now we're out of the southwest at that negligible one mile per hour at this time of morning in a few hours they will then shift out of the north northwest picking up to their usual five to ten miles per hour shifting later on this evening out of the north maintaining that uh clip of five to ten miles per hour we're says we're going to have a low in the upper 50s tonight that would be quite nice i think that would be fine i can handle that though tomorrow looks like we may be a tad higher in the mid to mid 90s instead of the lower 90s indeed let's see uh dry conditions will continue give me the 10 percent precipitation just give me some hope but they say that there's no pollen how can that be air quality index is good at 28 parts per million the daytime uv index remains high though it is now even a tick lower at six indicative of the angle of the sun i am sure Visibility is up to 10 miles and relative humidity is at 68% and pressure is falling at 29.93 inches. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchase. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property and these people positively live around the world. Yes. Uh, For all of you interested, that is my pee tape, and I try to do it all in one breath. Sometimes I don't. London is 68 and partly cloudy. Paris is 68 and cloudy. Rome is 80 degrees and partly cloudy. Kiev, 83 and fair. Kabul is 77 degrees and fair. Hong Kong, 80 and fair. Tokyo is 82 and mostly cloudy with thunderstorm and electrical activity, which could impact critical electrical infrastructure. Be warned. Sydney, Australia is 55 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 56 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Sunny and you're going to get hot. You've been warned officially. By the officials, it is a heat advisory. Drink plenty of fluids, not the kind that dehydrate you, unless you back it up with some hydrating fluids. Just stay cool, New York. I know you will. And that is Weather from Around the World, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchase. These people plan to these purchase personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. Right. 
first offering here at the Chef's Table, a West Coast cookbook and speakeasy, is brought to you by Anonymous Worker Bees of the Agence France Press. Talk about egalitarian. Okay. I think that's why they can't. Got the term. Uh, with the devastating, tragic, and just heart-wrenching news of the Brazilian National Museum uh, succumbing to a major conflagration, which in destroyed over 200 million artifacts, a 200, I'm sorry, 2 million artifacts, 20 million, I'm sorry, 20 million artifacts, 200 year old museum, and all of that culture and all of that uh, just art and humanity got up in flames. This story, uh, of the one of the oldest villages discovered in the Nile Delta with artifacts unearthed dating back to the 5th millennium BC is maybe a heartening story. Remains of the village were uncovered by a French Egyptian team at Tel Samara in northeastern Egypt, the uh, Antiquities Ministry said. Similar structures dating to the period between 4200 B.C. and 2900 B.C. have never been found in that region, the ministry's antiquities chief said. The only similar discovery has been the village of Says in the Garbia Gover Governorate, north of Cairo. Excavations of Tel Samara in the Dakalia government northeast of the capital uncovered a number of silos containing, containing numerous animal bones and vegetable residue. Archaeologists who had been working at the site since 2015 also found pottery and stone tools at the site, according to the ministry statement. The discoveries confirm the presence of stable communities in the humid areas of the Delta from the 5th millennium B.C. And the findings have, have offered a unique occasion to learn more about the prehistoric communities who lived in the Delta before the Pharaonic rule. Well, this is quite interesting because before you had monuments to uh, the great gods walking among uh, the mere mortals, uh, you had a, a, a thriving civilization already. And then I guess ego got in the way, which it usually does when you're touched by the sun god. Or maybe a cat. I know I would. And, uh, but... I think this is quite a heartening discovery because it learns, well, it teaches us, hopefully, and we can learn that there's more to our humanity than the small amount of time that we ascribe to it, which is usually the sum total of whatever it, years that we have happened to be on Earth. And it starts whenever we're born and nothing existed before. And we need to remember that's not the case, that uh, we're a continuum in the warp and woof of space and time. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez. Toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. This last offering here at the Chef's Table and West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, is again brought to us by anonymous worker bees at the Agence France Press, because they know. Doctors and scientists increasingly suspect attacks with unconventional microwave weapons as the cause of the mysterious ailments that have stricken more than three dozen American diplomats 
and their families in Cuba and China. The victims reported hearing intense, high-pitched sounds in their hotel rooms or homes, followed by symptoms that included nausea, severe headaches, fatigue, dizziness, sleep problems, and hearing loss. A medical team that examined 21 of those affected in Cuba did not mention microwave weapons as a cause in a study published in March in the Journal of the American Medical Association, but its lead author, Douglas Smith, the director of the Center for Brain Injury and Repair at the University of Pennsylvania, told the New York Times that microwave weapons are now considered a main suspect and that the team is increasingly sure the diplomats suffered brain injury. Everybody was relatively skeptical at first, he was quoted as saying, and everyone now agrees there's something there. Neither the State Department nor the FBI has publicly pointed to microwave weapons as the culprit because they want to use them, too, in secret. On us! And uh, there were many unanswered questions as to who might have carried out the attacks and why. Oh, I can guess why, and I have a pretty good suspicion about who. After holding Cuba responsible for either carrying out the attacks or failing to protect American officials, the U.S. in September of 2017 recalled more than half of its staff from the embassy and expelled 15 Cuban diplomats from Washington. Cuba has firmly denied any role in or knowledge of the incidents. In June of 2018, the State Department announced it had sent home U.S. government personnel from China after they reported eerily similar incidents. Now, according to the Times, an American scientist, Alan Fry, first discovered in 1960 that the brain can perceive microwaves as sounds. His discovery opened a new field of research that ultimately led the U.S. and the Soviet Union to explore microwaves' potential use in unconventional weapons. No, they're not going to help us get to the stars to get off a dying planet. They're going to make sure that they destroy every last bit of all the, I don't know, vermin who have been living on the skin of the earth. Eek! The Russians dubbed uh, the class of envisioned weapons as psychophysical or psychotronic. And our guys just called them sound bombs. It is said the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency warned in 1976... The Soviet research on a microwave showed potential for disrupting the behavior patterns of military or diplomatic personnel. A National Security Agency statement obtained by Washington lawyer Mark Zaid on behalf of a client described how a foreign power built a weapon designed to bathe the target's living quarters in microwaves, causing numerous physical effects, including a damaged nervous system. The U.S. military also researched weapon applications of microwaves, with the Air Force winning a patent on an invention shown to beam comprehensible speech into an adversary's head. It's God talking to you. Okay. Navy researchers explored the use of the Fry effect to induce sounds powerful enough to cause painful discomfort and even immobilize a subject... And the Times said it's not known if Washington deploys such weapons. Which means they're deploying such weapons. All right, well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. And uh, Netroots Radio, of course, will be broadcasting on with all the breaking news. We'll meet up with you tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, indeed. And uh, do stay tuned to Networks Radio for the rest of the day through the night. And we will visit with you tomorrow. In West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert Tell it did des photos de bord de mer, de manger à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je 
veux changer d'atmosphère T'en manges à d'un hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie de novembre Tes mains qui coulent Je n'en peux plus de t'attendre Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 